Amen. Well, we've had a wonderful morning thinking of the one-eyed dolphin. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope nobody is going to sleep, whether with one or two eyes this morning. But uh, let me turn you to the Bible. We're looking in the, <clears throat> we're still in the <clears throat> section of Genesis on the flood of Noah, which is from chapter 6 to chapter 9, this whole section. And uh, we started last time I spoke on uh, looking at the state of the world, the parlous state of the world with uh, violence, demonic interference, and the corruption of the human race, the genetic corruption of the human race through the invasion of evil spirits. Some have even speculated that when it says that uh, Noah was uh, perfect in his generations, this was a reference to that he was the only one who was uncorrupted by the genetic invasion of evil into the world, and that this was an attempt to spoil the whole plan of God to have a seed through which Messiah would come to save the human race. Well, that's interesting. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. And it's hard to know these things, but we're looking, we're moving on now. We're going to look into chapter seven. Last time we looked at the, the character of the, 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 the world from Adam's fall right through to the flood. And God, of course, putting a huge question mark over the human race. That was our main point, that our repentance is to accept God's judgment on our state but to accept it in a way that we will, can be changed and saved. So let's go into chapter 7. Then the Lord, at the end of chapter 6, the last word of chapter 6 was that Noah did according to all that God commanded him. He was obedient. And the Lord said to Noah, now the time has passed. Noah is 600 years old and he's built the ark in a place where there is no water and God said to Noah, the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And then he says, you shall take with you every, uh, of every clean animal seven and two of each unclean animal. So seven of each clean animal and two of each, male and female, of unclean animals. And then in verse 4, after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth. Forty days, forty nights. And I will destroy from the face of the earth all the living things that I have made. And he did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So he went into the ark, verse 7, he took of the animals two by two and of the clean animal, unclean animals seven and by seven and um, <clears throat> seven into the ark to Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood, verse 10, were on the earth. And then in verse 11, in the 600th year, the fountains of the great deep were opened up, the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. They entered in, and at the end of verse 16, so those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood was on the earth 40 days. Uh, the waters prevailed over the earth, verse 19, exceedingly. The high hills were covered. 15 cubits and upward, that's about 20 something feet. The mountains were covered and all flesh died. Then in chapter 8, then God, verse 1, remembered Noah. And uh, the fountains of the deep, verse 2, were stopped. The windows of heaven were stopped. The rain from heaven restrained. And the, the waters decreased. And then in verse 4 of chapter 8, the ark rested 
in the seventh month, the seventh day, 17th day of the month on Mount Ararat. And the waters decrease continually. And in the 10th month, the 10th, the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. Came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window and he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro. It's a, a scavenger and uh, it would rest on the dead bodies, I guess, if there were any left or whatever was there and feeding. Verse eight, he also sent out from himself a dove um, but the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. And so she returned and he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself, waited again seven days. He sent the dove out of the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening with a freshly plucked olive leaf. So he knew there was, um, there was fresh growth trees were a tree was growing so he waited another seven days and sent out the dove which did not return to him anymore and then in verse 15 the water the water was the land was dried and in verse 15 of chapter 8 God spoke to Noah go out of the ark you and your wife and your sons and your son's wives and bring out with you all the animals and the birds go in and be fruitful and multiply on the earth and so Noah went out of the ark so we've reached we've just covered if you like by reading those two chapters seven and eight which describes how the flood took place in chapter nine which we're not going to read now we read what happened after Noah came down from the ark and uh, that we find that then God gave, gave a, a new covenant with Noah and with the human race and he made the mark of the covenant was the rainbow. We'll come to that another time. So we have a description of the flood and let's just stand back from it if you like and look at the big picture and uh, what you see is before the flood you see a a world, stand back from the world and you see the world covered with violence. You see um, problems everywhere and uh, corruption, uh, demonic forces, a world covered with evil and going wrong. And then you see God baptizing the world. Only God could baptize the world. We could baptize, we can baptize one another. We can uh, dip something in water. And I guess we can do some, if we had the machinery, we could do some pretty big baptisms of things, objects. There's an industrial baptism where they dip things in acid. And uh, wow, we, there's all kinds of things that men can do, but to baptize the whole planet in water, that was an act of God, and that's what God did. He baptized the whole planet in water, and he washed it. He cleansed it. It was a break from the old into the new. God cleansed it, broke all the demonic powers that were interfering in the human race, caused the violence to cease, the sexual chaos, God baptized. And when we use the word baptize, of course, the word baptism is, of course, washing. God washed the world. And um, he not only washed the world, but he placed Noah and his family into the ark. So at the end of uh, a short time, you would have looked on the surface of the water. Now you would see no more violence no more demonic interference. You would see only the ark floating on a pure planet. So the whole planet covered with water, the ark floating on the, on the waters, and Noah and his family in the ark. And of course, it's a picture of 
what God does in baptism with the Spirit, baptizing us into Christ, putting us into him, and washing all the things of the former creation away and cleansing our hearts. This is a great picture of baptism with the Holy Spirit, and it's cataclysmic, and baptism with the Holy Spirit is cataclysmic. It is a huge transformation in the depths of a person's heart. There is a cataclysmic work of God called the baptism with the Holy Spirit. We could read testimonies now. We could give our testimonies. When I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, my life was transformed. So many things were, were washed out of me, and I became a man of prayer. I became a servant of God. I didn't earn anything. I didn't deserve anything. It was by grace. God did this amazing work to change my life. It was a break, a huge break by the power of God. There is a baptism with the Holy Spirit. Um, and thank God for it. Uh, I don't know if you've received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I know some people receive a touch from the Holy Spirit and they are very anxious sometimes about whether they've received or not. And um, as I've said before, the baptism of the Spirit isn't a condition of salvation. It is the inheritance which Christ has bought for all who are saved. And it is your right to have this. It is your inheritance. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts. And God has provided this tremendous blessing. And you are to seek this blessing. Don't be satisfied with a touch. Um, some people have not known a, such a break in their life uh, from the former things. But there is a transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Seek this work of the Holy Spirit. This is what we're on this morning. This great work of baptism with the Holy Spirit. And uh, of course, not only... Uh, did, did he bring uh, them into the ark? But in the ark, he brought peace and harmony. It's a miraculous thing that God gives us peace of heart, shalom, great peace of mind, peace of our being, which then produces peace in relationships, in marriage, in the church. The animals were living in harmony with one another and not eating each other. <laughs> That's a miracle. It's, a, it's terrible when churches are divided. It's a testimony that not everyone in that church has been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Of course, the lines of divisions in churches are not clean. You couldn't say, oh, one side of a division was baptized with the Holy Spirit and the other wasn't. But it is sin that causes division in churches. And peace is the effect of being crucified with Christ. We have peace in our hearts and uh, we have peace with one another. If you're not at peace with people, you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If you've not got peace in your heart, you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If your mind is troubled and and, and, and uh, easily provoked and uh, annoyed and always, there's, that's not peace in your heart. That is trouble. That is a need in your heart. God wants to bring you to be at peace, whether it's within your marriage, within relationships. If you're a person who aggravates people and is always aggravated in your own self, you need a baptism with the Holy Spirit and God's got it for you. This is God's promise, and you need it, and we must get into this work of God. This is the key to living New Testament Christianity. The heart and center of New Testament Christianity is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The New Testament New Covenant really began on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Jesus announced that it was coming. And it, it came in power on the day of Pentecost. Now, we've also seen there that uh, the, the raven sent out. I have 
no particular insights into the meaning of the raven. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But the dove finds rest. And this is the point. The dove finds rest in a heart. Uh, and there is this abiding of the Holy Spirit in one who has experienced this work of the cross. And we'll come to this uh, as we look at this. this uh, the key word in this whole event is Noah. It's made a lot of before the event in the prophecy of, of his father, was it Lamech, his father? And he named him Noah. He said he will give us rest. He will comfort us. And the word Noah means rest and comfort. And we have the comforter, the one who, and Jesus said, I will give you rest. In this whole passage of um, the flood, you, if you could read the Hebrew, I'm not a Hebrew expert, but I can read these two chapters, these three, these four chapters, six to nine. I can read them in Hebrew. And when you read them, you find the word Noah is woven into the passage. So you find, for example, that the ark rested and the Hebrew word is a verb based on the word Noah. The, um, the ark Noahed on the mountain of Ararat. And the and the the dove by the word the, by the way the word dove is Jonah in Hebrew uh, Jonah and uh, uh, Jonah couldn't find rest couldn't find Noah you, you remember it by that Jonah couldn't find Noah he couldn't find the rest for his foot and Noah is 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 what the Holy Spirit is looking for he wants to find rest in us and you find that word repeated about five or six times in the text apart from the name of Noah. So it's the end of striving, the, it's grace, it's peace. It's the end of trying to please God or to earn things. When we come to this tremendous work of God, uh, it's, it's such a blessing. And of course, there are, as I, I, I'm not going to go into all the detail now, but there are eight pictures of uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit in the Bible, miracle of water and uh, here it is that uh, this is an act by water of destruction and recreation um, when you look at the miracles of water sometimes it's for empowering like uh, Elijah and Elisha went through the waters and uh, of the Jordan together and it was to get empowering some of the miracles of water speak of some power being added. Some of them speak of something being taken away. And here in the flood of Noah, it talks of things being taken away. And so we, we have this, this great meaning of the flood of Noah. But let's just look at it now in a more personal sense. And my question to you is, in your personal life, as this was a break, from old things into new things, my question to you is, how clear is the break in your life? You see, when we come to baptism, we come with two things, repentance and faith. That's how John the Baptist baptized people, and they repented and believed, and that's what is the foundation of salvation. But when they were baptized by John in water, again, it's a picture here uh, of the of what of baptism in the spirit. John always said, he said, I baptize you with water, but another is coming. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And repentance and faith are the turning of our hearts to break with the past. And baptism with the Spirit is the inward break of all the power of the first creation, breaking the power of Adam in our souls, the demonic strongholds, a new creation inwardly. And uh, praise God, the old destroyed. What is the old? The old is selfish, uh, complaining, sinful indulgent, worldly, miserable, depressed, seeking physical pleasures. That's the old. What's the new? It's joyful, 
Christ-centered, with inner peace, yet with a ruggedness, and praising God, and building altars to God. This is the new world that we're being brought into. Now, this is the break. When we repent and believe, we are declaring our break with the past and are looking for the new. And uh, the, we're looking for a work of God. And I've just been reading the, uh, as I probably told you before, the biography of Adoniram Judson. I've got quite a long biography here, the, the to the Golden Shore. Adoniram Judson was the missionary, the great missionary to Burma. And he went there in 1813 during the Napoleonic Wars. And he worked there. It was incredibly difficult. There was a there, there was and still is. I've been to Rangoon and I've seen the great golden pagoda in Rangoon, this gold leaf covering it. You can see it all over the city, uh, this great golden Buddhist pagoda. And there's some of the hairs of the Buddha, the Gautama, are there in the great golden temple in not golden temple, the great the great gold covered uh, pagoda there in Rangoon. And he arrived there and started to work and he prayed and he, he doubted that anybody would become a Christian because it was so hard. They were so attached to Buddhism and he prayed and prayed. And then to his surprise, one day there came into his little discussion places that he held in a kind of semi-public place by a street. There came a man who was interested and he believed and the first convert and then another quickly followed and they had three converts and then this was about seven years after they'd started their work and then with it he was praying for 10 converts that they might just have a foundation it was very difficult when they baptized the first three they baptized them in the sight in the plain sight of the golden pagoda they could see it and people could see them being baptized. Afterwards, they found it more difficult because of the great um, pressure on them to stay within their culture. And it's astonishing the courage of these early converts. And I guess it's in a way indicative of the depth of their repentance that they were looking to overthrow centuries of cultural domination and breaking with something that was so strong in them and in their society. But here's what I wanted to read to you from Adoniram Judson's book, because when the, there were people coming, and of course this is now, he's had three who repented and they were, were so wonderful, and then some more came, but he wasn't quick to baptize them. He asked them why they wanted to be baptized. And uh, there was one lady, the first uh, one uh, um, woman came, the first woman to be baptized. Um, she, uh, she, he asked her, why do you want to be baptized? And she said, well, if the teacher thinks it's suitable, I would like to be baptized. But this response did not satisfy Adoniram Judson. He told her he could not baptize anyone who could possibly be easy in mind without it. And he's talking about water baptism. Adoniram Judson wasn't a, a Pentecostal, he wasn't a charismatic, he hadn't known the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and uh, he, he, in a way, it was very simple. He was concentrating on this, but it was repentance and faith that was the main message. But he wouldn't even baptize someone with water unless they were so clear that they could not live at peace without it. It's astonishing. And I notice that um, following this, of course, there was persecution and difficulties arising. 
And uh, when you look in some countries, when people get baptized in water, they are taking their life in their hands. If the neighbors find, if the family find out during some of the recent times in Iraq, in Baghdad, there have been many coming to the Lord more than ever. But somebody said, I don't have any evidence for this. At one point, the average lifespan of someone who baptized after baptism was two weeks. They were killed if they were from a Muslim family. They were martyred within two weeks and uh, targeted. What a, what, a, what a point. But the point is, you see, the point I'm making is that people argue about baptism and different kinds of baptism. And some people drift into baptism. I don't know if you're baptized but in water, but I do challenge you to get baptized. But my challenge is... It's a break, an absolute break with former things. This is the important thing. And um, it, it sometimes, if I forgive the, uh, the, the mixed metaphor, watered down <laughs> by people and, and, and diluted and weakened and people drift into it without this realization that you shouldn't really just drift into baptism. You should only be baptized if you can't live without, in peace without it. There is an inner compulsion. I must obey the Lord. I must follow in the steps of Jesus. I must belong to him. Cost what it may. And um, I want to make this clear to powers, principalities, and to anybody who asks me. Of course, baptism in some countries may be very secretive to protect the lives of people. But... In the end, no one can keep it secret for long because there will be situations where you will have to stand up for your faith and you cannot keep it hidden. And so we've got this, this first challenge is, 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 is the very picture of baptism in water. Now, of course, it says in, in um, let me read to you from what uh, Peter says in his letter, because it's relevant here. Peter said in his letter, this is in... Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 to 22 he said Christ suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but made alive by the spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison speaking of a mysterious thing that Christ went down into uh, Tartarus into Hades to preach to the spirits in prison and who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few that is eight souls were saved through water this is also an antitype which now saves us baptism not the removal of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of the dead. And here we've got this, this, if you like, this is what he's talking about here, this great work of God to, to, to uh, as we break with the past, the key for us, the key for you is a break. It's this act of repentance to break with the past, and of course, this is not just a picture of God's activity in saving us. The, the baptism is itself a picture of the cross, that we embrace the cross. We embrace it as a, as, a, 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 as a power to release us from former things. We embrace it as the power of God and as a way of life. And we embrace the cross also because it is unto a new creation. We are being created inside. Of course, this flood of Noah is also taken up in other places. Let me read um, uh, uh, when Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, the coming of the Son of Man shall be. And um, what we have here is that the flood of Noah is also a picture of the end of the world. God broke with that former world and created a new world. And it's a picture that God is going to break 
with this present evil world and create a new one. Christ is coming. I feel quite a, I don't know what the right word is, shiver in my soul when I look across the world today and realize what COVID is doing to the planet. And I realize that the hand of God is on the planet. And uh, of course, that's always been the case. It isn't just through COVID, but now God is uh, laying bare his hand to shake the planet. Who can doubt that God's hand is on the planet and that maybe this is the beginning of the final countdown to his coming? Maybe within a few months, Christ will come. Maybe there will be terrible uh, things happening in the next few months, building up to a terrible war and the coming of Christ. It can happen very suddenly within months. This could all be over and we could be in, in the end of this present age and the coming of Christ. We all want time to go on as normal. And let me read to you what 2 Peter chapter 3 says about this. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? He's not coming. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Uniformitarianism. Everything gradual, everything slow. For this they willfully forget. They deliberately choose to forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old. And the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. And we are hurtling forward in history to the day of judgment. What do we get from these verses? We've, we've, we, we're, we're looking at the impending judgment, just as God did judge the world in the flood of Noah. It is a declaration that he is going to judge the world again. A short time will pass and we will stand and see the judgment seat of Christ. It is going to be an awesome and terrible day of the Lord. And of course, we're looking at that, at that too in the book of Revelation. The last trumpet is coming and it will sound. When you look at all these things, you realize the urgency of the gospel. I think when Noah preached and told people, get ready, this is God is coming to judge the world, and it is our message today. Repent, believe, get baptized, break with the past, and pray God for a deep inward transformation of your heart, the renewing of your whole inner life, and uh, oh, may God work in every one of us. We want to be people who are not just uh, a little in the right direction pointing. We want to be utterly clear in our turning to the Lord and God is on our side. We can turn and we, if, we, if you find heart, repentance hard, if you find faith hard, the Bible says God will help us do these things. All he asks of us is a heart to respond and turn to him and receive the help of grace. Noah, we're going to see it another time, was uh, no great man himself, but he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And this is the great thing, that we respond to the whispers of grace that are offered to every one of us, that we may escape the judgment to come, and that we may be found in Christ, belonging to him, and be his people. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for us all. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you for that work you began in Burma. And there was great persecution, but the work has increased and flourished and there are thousands in Burma who follow you. And we praise you for those early converts. And Lord, I pray this moment, challenge every one of us to be absolutely clear in our break with the past, in our break with the ways of the flesh, in our turning away from the ways of self unto you. And we turn again this day and surrender our lives entirely into your hands by faith. And I pray for your people, everyone listening to my voice, deepen and radicalize repentance and faith in every heart. And let it be unto a clear, wonderful, gracious baptism with the Holy Spirit. That each one may know that tremendous work of grace. Transforming our lives and keep us burning in this place with love for Jesus. Looking unto your coming with eagerness and holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Amen.